esteemed judges, professors, friends, and most importantly, fellow graduate students. Here we are after toiling, after so much research, and I find it rather ironic that I'm up first to present on ways to decrease stress and increase our quality of life. I mean, does that happen as a graduate student? Self-care is a term that has traditionally been used by those in helping professions, but we don't discuss it enough. I come from an army chaplain perspective. Chaplains nurture the living by providing confidential counseling and ministry to soldiers and their families. Care for the wounded by operating in wartime environments where soldiers are exposed to unimaginable suffering and pain. And honor the, fall uh, the fallen by commemorating those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. If chaplains don't tend to their own methods of self-care, they risk becoming casualties themselves. Self-care not only applies to cha chaplains, but to everyone, for we all experience stress. And Joseph Smith, the first LDS prophet, definitely experienced stress. One way that Latter-day Saints find spiritual self-care is by looking to their prophets for guidance. The life of Joseph Smith is replete with practices that can help us become more self-care aware. For example, many know that Joseph wrestled, and we hear that he always won, and that he usually did, except against one match against Old Man Lot, where he just couldn't seem to throw him. Another time he wrestled a shy Baptist preacher after a conversation about religion, but that, my friends, is another story. In a letter to his wife, Joseph tenderly reveals what it meant to be able to communicate while he was away. He wrote, quote, I hope you will continue to communicate to me by your own hand, for this is a consolation to me in my lonely moments. I also feel a satisfaction to write a few lines with my own hand. In this way, I can have the privilege to communicate some of my feelings that I should not otherwise have had. My research not only examines the life of the prophet Joseph Smith, but it explores the modern day research that supports such practices. Practices that show the positive therapeutic benefits of letter writing, or what goes on in the brain during prayer that causes us to become more selfless. Joseph's greatest methods of self-care were spiritual. The prophet, he possessed a solid faith that would help him to withstand the greatest amounts of persecution. It is my hypothesis that Joseph was able to withstand so much distress because his own faith and spiritual self-care would turn into healthy stress that helps us grow. My objective is that my research might encourage LDS chaplains and audiences to become more self-care aware, that this might become more commonly and uh, researched and practiced, and that someday that this might even serve as a future catalyst into creating a, a series that explores similar practices of all the LDS prophets. So is self-care possible for grad students? I think so. Thank you, and please take care of yourself. Sometime during this presentation, will you get your phone out and take a picture of me? You see, according to the U.S. Labor and uh, Statistics Department, there are really only about 3,800 full-time photojournalists. And 36% of those jobs are expected to decline in the next few years. 2013, Chicago Sun-Times lays off its entire photographic staff of 28. And then just last January, Sports Illustrated let go of all of the remainder of its photographers. Now, why is this happening? And is it even important? Well, through a series of qualitative interviews with photojournalists from around the country, I basically discovered some direct and indirect reasons for the demise of the profession. First and perhaps most important reason, bottom line economics. You see, the print media is in survival mode for its very existence. They're grasping for relevancy, as well as the advertising dollars that the internet has siphoned off. Today, almost everybody has a smartphone with a camera. Could it possibly be a simple truth that the masses are better able to capture the moment the breaking news, the historical event better than a photojournalist who arrives after the fact. And individuals like you and I are basically sending our pictures to the media for free with plenty of apps to help facilitate that. And then we devalue those images by uploading billions of still and moving images to Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, Vine, Periscope, YouTube, Facebook. You see, the world can accept the blurry image. And they can also believe that these raw, gritty, amateur supplied photos represent reality. And perhaps they're right. Neil Burgess, former chair of the World Press Photo, said, 
photojournalists will be the first to go. Then, as the printed media business model fails, then the writers will have to go. And see, that's why this research is so important, because as the photojournalists depart, then its mother profession, journalism, changes, evolves, erodes as the amateurs step in. Blurred truths, devalued opinions. All these pictures, by the way, behind me were taken by amateurs. Many say that the best camera is the one that you have with you when you need it the most. My research suggests, and this is how it concludes, that in the future, the best photographer may very well be any person with any camera who just happens to be there when things happen. So go ahead and take out your cell phones and take my picture, because from this time forward, you are the photojournalists of tomorrow. After 30 years of fatherhood research, we have shown that men have a tremendous impact on their children. But what we don't know is what makes a good dad. After all these years, scholars have come up with a highly sophisticated classification system for the quality of a the father. There's good ones and there's bad ones. That's it. But shouldn't we be able to find different types of good dads, men who engage their children in their own unique ways? What about Goofy Dad, Bodybuilder Dad, Star Wars Dad, or Matching Mohawks Dad? For my research, I wanted to see if this, if this system of good, bad, or somewhere in between is true, or whether there are different uh, types of good dads. Uh, because being able to be more accurate in how we describe dads can help us to know what kind of dad a man will be, how he'll get involved, and what impact this involvement will have on his family. I examined over 60 ways men interact with their children, falling under classifications like uh, affection, play, discipline, support. I expected to find fathers who were high in some areas and low in other areas according to their type. And guess what I found? Dads are either good or bad. <laughs> Men engage with their children in all of these ways equally, just in varying degrees. So really good dads participate in all 60, really bad dads participate in none of them. And at first when I saw this, I was shocked. I was heartbroken. I thought, Mohawk dad, how could you? <laughs> But then I thought, okay, if dads are really either good or bad, we need to be able to predict whether they'll be good. So I looked at everything that influences uh, men's parenting, the relationship with the mother, race, income, gender, how many hours they work, and I noticed something interesting. When men had high fathering attitudes, or in other words, when men felt like being a father was the most important role in their life, none of those other things mattered. Somehow, they found a way to be involved with their children. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because when men say that they work too much to spend time with their children, what they're probably saying is that they don't understand how important being a father is. It matters because current fathering programs focus heavily on parenting skills and relationship skills. But maybe in addition to this, we need to teach men how important their role is as a father and the impact that it has on their children. Maybe in our efforts to teach young boys and teens what it is to be a man, we can teach them that one day they can make a choice, that they can be a good dad, and that it just may be the most important thing that they ever do for themselves, their children, and their families. Thank you. I want you to picture your yard. If it's anything like mine was growing up, it has one to two patches of grass that just refuse to be green. No matter how much you invest in a perfectly uniform sprinkler system. You could leave the sprinklers on for twice as long, and that might solve the problem, but that can be expensive and hard to justify when most of your lawn is already satisfied. Now imagine that you're a farmer, and instead of dealing with this problem on a quarter acre yard, you're contending with hundreds of acres of crop fields. Your industry uses 80% of consumable water in the United States. And because water scarcity is increasing at an alarming rate, leaving the sprinklers on for twice as long simply isn't an option. If anything, you're required to decrease your water use year after year. The solution to this patchy lawn problem seems simple. Put more water where it's needed and less where it's not. Well, this concept is called precision irrigation, and it's gaining popularity in modern agriculture. But it lacks an important component, 
and that is the ability to know in detail which areas need more water and which areas need less. To answer this question, farmers need to understand how the soil varies across a field. But unfortunately, measuring the important soil properties is expensive, so that measuring at more than a few locations on a field is out of the question. My research is to figure out how to use a few measurements at various locations and depths across a field to fill in the rest, both horizontally and vertically to about five feet in depth. To do this, I work in an area of statistics called spatial statistics, which leverages the fact that points that are close together in space, or on the field here, will have similar properties. Now within this area, I developed a new method equipped to handle some of the more complex nuances present in this kind of data, such as the fact that points that are close together horizontally might have a different relationship than points that are close together vertically. The results for a particular field in Colorado are pictured here. I used my technique with the data on the left to produce soil property estimates everywhere on the field and at five different depths. I could similarly take this technique to any field on any farm, potentially conserving billions of gallons of water. But that's not where it ends. This technique can also be applied to any discipline that has data over points in space, which includes almost any discipline, whether it be environmental, geological, or even biological. And that's how I hope to save the planet with spatial statistics. Thank you. that teamwork would be a core principle at a hospital, right? Well, at many facilities, healthcare providers struggle to work together. This problem has many causes, including really sick patients, right? And different providers with different philosophies. When the patient experiences a healthcare team with poor teamwork, it looks something like this. Man, I think I've had a stroke and I'm in this hospital bed, but what's really worrying me is I have to get up these stairs to get to my house. I can't even get out of bed. Then the doctor comes in. Hello, Ms. Diaz. Yes, it looks like you've experienced a bilateral occlusive pica stroke with an infarct to the temporal region. Oh, what, what does that mean? Um, yes, it just means that you need to be cautious with bending and twisting. Follow up with the rehab team. Thank you. Oh, okay. Then the nurse walks in. Hey, my name is Florence. I'm a nurse today. Let's wash your back. Okay, bend forward, scrub, scrub. But the doctor said something about like the bending thing. And the deeper great. We got you clean. I'll see you at lunchtime next. Do do Then a physical therapist comes in. Hello, my name is Tom. I'm your physical therapist. Yeah, work with me. Bend and twist and bend and twist. Wait, but the doctor said like that bending thing and deeper and twist. Good, this will get you back stronger. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Wait, I have these stairs. Hold on. Maybe you or a family member or a loved one has experienced something similar to this patient where healthcare providers have poor teamwork. In my research project, we implemented a teamwork intervention at a stroke rehabilitation department. This intervention included things like teaching nurses and physical therapists to move patients using the same techniques. And before and after this intervention, we used surveys to measure teamwork. We also measured patients' ability to move and speak to see if they regained more movement and speech after our intervention. Well, we've got the results, and the healthcare providers love it. Nurses and nurses' assistants are communicating better with physical therapists and occupational therapists. There was even this little improvement in patients' ability to move and speak. But sometimes in healthcare, those little improvements make a big difference. Imagine if you were that patient laying in the bed, figure out, trying to figure out how you're going to get up those stairs to your house. Imagine if your health providers came and really listened to you and worked together to come up with a plan. And when you got out of the hospital, you looked up those stairs and you somehow managed to climb up them. And you hugged your spouse tight and you climbed into your own comfortable bed. That sounds like success to me. Thank you. Never in the history of organized religion are so many young people questioning or leaving the faith they once grew up with. And to be honest, nobody really knows why. For every young person who leaves the faith, another reason is given. 
As an aspiring psychologist interested in the scientific study of religion, I wanted to explore this question with one simple yet big question. How do millennials see God in their lives? To address this, we conducted a nationwide study involving more than 5,000 millennials who completed a variety of psychological assessments, many of which addressed how people see God in their lives. I applied some fairly sophisticated statistical models to their responses, and what I found astonished me. There are five clearly identifiable ways millennials see God in their lives. Now, our first two groups generally report a positive relationship with God. Our first group is very confident and has a desire to be close to God, and they generally avoid doing things that would damage their relationship. And for this reason, I see them as confident. Now, our second group is just as confident, but they have one unique difference. They seek God through frequent and emotional prayer. And for this reason, I call them communers. Now, in contrast to our first two groups, our last three struggle with their relationship with God in very distinct ways. Our third group has a, has a desire to be close to God, but they intensely worry about the relationship. When they see God act in the lives of others, they tend to get jealous and even feel left behind. This combination of having a desire to be close to God, yet being anxious about the relationship, says to me that this, these people get concerned when they see God act in the lives of others, but not their own. Now, our fourth group has a general idea that they want to be close to God, but they want to be self-reliant in what happens in their lives. Consequently, they avoid seeking God through prayer. And for this reason, they have more of a cognitive relationship with God. And our final group has a general need to be with God, but they don't quite know how to see or even include God in their lives. And for this reason, I see them as conflicted. Now, interestingly, the first two groups, if you're a communer or, or confident, you have higher levels of life satisfaction, uh, psychological well-being, and generally stronger social relationships. Conversely, if you're cognitive, conflicted, or concerned, you have higher levels of anxiety, depression, and poor social relationships. Now surprisingly, the biggest, differentiator, the biggest differentiating factor between these two large groups has nothing to, to do with spirituality or religiosity. Quite the opposite. In fact, the biggest differentiating factor is how close or how connected they feel with those that are around them, namely their peers, parents, and romantic partners. Now we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what religion and spirituality means to millennials, especially LDS, but we now have evidence to show that how their relationship with God affects their personal and social lives. Thank you. The poet John Donne once wrote, quote, no man is an island unto himself, close quote. With this thought in mind, my, my project looked at how the effects of primary trauma exposed by a parent in a combat situation can uh, transmit and uh, transmit to the family and affect the family in a, as a family unit. As a, fa as a parent, rather, experiences primary trauma in war in the form of a, co of a car bombing, combat, watching a fellow comrade fall in death, their scars and symptoms of primary trauma can affect and be transmitted to their children in the form of secondary trauma. The parent may experience the reliving of the traumatic experience, have anger outbursts, have trouble sleeping, etc. And this process of primary trauma becoming secondary trauma in a child is called secondary traumatization. The effects of primary trauma and secondary trauma are similar and mimic one another. But the key difference between these two is that those who suffer from secondary trauma typically do not experience a major traumatic event themselves. And the effects of secondary trauma can be thought of on a continuum, where on one hand, on one end rather, there is little to no long-term effect that the child or adolescent may experience. Or on the other end, the child or adolescent may experience their own post-traumatic stress disorder and have higher rates of suicidal thoughts and ideation. In between these two spectrums, the research shows that children of combat veterans are 10 to 20% more likely to experience higher levels of anxiety, attachment issues, behavioral problems, and depression. One task of chaplains in the US military is to support not only those service members who suffer from primary trauma, but their family members who may suffer from secondary trauma as well. In this regard, and with this in mind, my research project culminated with the development of training materials to be used by chaplains to help parents of military children be protected from and mitigate the effects of secondary trauma.
The intervention technique that my training materials covers is called bibliotherapy. Bibliotherapy is simply defined as the use of books to help another better understand themselves, others, and the world around them. Furthermore, bibliotherapy has been shown to help teach coping skills and coping strategies. Even though initially bibliotherapy was developed and implemented in the hospital setting to help patients better understand their medical diagnoses and treatment options, the research clearly shows and suggests that bibliotherapy used by a parent in the home with a child or adolescent can help protect that child and adolescent from the scars of secondary traumatization and heal from the wounds of secondary traumatization and thereby lessen the rippling effect of trauma in the family. Thank you. Imagine that you turned in a term paper last week and you just got it back today looking like this. Now will all these corrections help you become a better writer? Do they discourage you? Is this a waste of your and your teacher's time? These questions have been highly debated over the past 20 years, especially in the area of teaching writing to English language learners. Now in response to overwhelming arguments against written corrective feedback, our own faculty and research team in the BYU Linguistics Department developed an innovative and ambitious method of this process. This exciting method is called dynamic written corrective feedback and is designed to make feedback meaningful as students can understand and use the feedback timely as teachers hand back the corrections the very next day after drafts are submitted constant as students are submitting new drafts on an almost daily basis and manageable as both teachers and students should have sufficient time to assign and use those corrections now these four principles are what make this method so unique. And guess what? It works. Many studies have been done on dynamic written corrective feedback and they have all resulted in significant improvement in English language learners writing accuracy. So since this research has been done, a class has been taught using dynamic written corrective feedback done at the English Language Center on campus. There's a problem though. Many of the teachers there are saying that this method is not as manageable as it claims to be. So for my research, I'm conducting a qualitative study investigating the questions of how are the teachers at the English Language Center using dynamic written corrective feedback in comparison to the original method? And what elements of how they are using it influencing the manageability for them? I'm gathering data by interviewing the teachers and also observing how their classroom is run for the entire semester. With my research, teachers and other researchers will be able to have a closer look at how we can make this process more manageable and help students improve their writing accuracy. <coughs> Countless students can significantly improve their writing. And this doesn't have to be a waste of time. Thank you. Raise your hand if you identify as a composer of music. We have a couple. Oh, that's great. I'd say about 3%. Let's make it 100 by the end of my presentation. I am a music historian, and music historians are known for studying and analyzing music from the past. I'm different, though. I'm interested in the music of the future. Now, in order to understand the music of the future, we need to take a look at the music of the present. Now, music is a social activity, and let's be honest, today's musical society is kind of corrupt. We keep comparing each other and deciding, oh, I can't do this because someone else is better. Um, so there is a level of hierarchy that needs to be gotten rid of. Imagine for a moment a utopian world where everyone can make any kind of music that they want without judgment. What kind of music would be created in this world? Pauline Oliveros is a composer who could answer that question. Through her music, she encourages peaceful musical communities by incorporating the utopian philosophies of equality and accessibility. For Pauline, everyone can be a composer, even you. Now, let's be music historians for a minute and take a look at a score by Pauline Oliveros. Doesn't look anything like Beethoven, does it? Looks more like a poem. Instead of using traditional notation methods, Oliveros offers up a prompt 
in the English language that anyone can understand. These prompts are also open-ended, free for interpretation. We get to improvise. Any sounds that we're able to create, bleep, blah, bleep, clap, snaps, whatever, they count. The only stipulation is that we listen to the sounds made by others and use those sounds to inform our own. Thus, a sense of community is created. This can be a model for utopian societies as a whole, where everyone is equal, but everyone is also unique and distinct from one another. Now, little communities like this are popping up everywhere. Their popularity is gaining quickly. And that's exciting because we can slowly see our musical society shift into a more accepting one. Now, will this change happen overnight? Absolutely not. Will it uh, happen all the way completely? We don't know. That's unlikely. These are questions I still hope to answer as I research. But in the meantime, are you a composer? Pauline Oliveros thinks so. Why not try? Thank you. Did you know that the number of natural disasters in the world more than tripled over the last 30 years? In fact, a study done in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 found that more than 217 million people a year since 1990 have been affected by a natural disaster. That's nearly two thirds of the population of the United States. Now, that's not even considering the man-made man disasters, such as the refugee crisis currently overwhelming much of Europe. How many of us have been moved by portraits of human suffering during a calamity and have felt the desire to help in some way? Often injuries and sickness are among the most visible types of suffering. It's no wonder that medical aid is an important part of disaster recovery and, and response. How, however, building a competent medical disaster response team is complex, especially on an international level. Many well-meaning organizations uh, react hastily and before they truly understand what, a, what an effective response requires and in their genuine effort to help end up contributing to the chaos. This is precisely the case when over 300,000 people were injured in the Haiti earthquake of 2010, a situation I'm personally, uh, I personally remember. Um, amazingly, over 400 medical disaster uh, response teams responded. However, many of those groups came underprepared, and consequently, uh, they were not only less effective, but in some cases, they even hindered the relief effort. The purpose of my research is to gain an understanding of the fundamental uh, principles required to form an effective disaster response team. Now addressing all aspects of disaster response is impossible to do in one study, so I will focus on what I believe are the three most important subjects. One is the legal risks and liabilities inherent to medical disaster relief. Two, the, the certifications required for volunteers to have or acquire. And three, the bureaucratic barriers as well as facilitators to providing medical response in foreign and extreme circumstances. I will do this by interviewing. Thank you. So phishing is a problem that we've all experienced, whether that's from getting an email from a Nigerian prince asking us to help him move some money, or being sent to a fake PayPal website that's trying to steal our username and password. The reality is we've all experienced this. And even more troubling is that this is causing real harm. In the US alone, 1.2 million computers have already been compromised because of phishing causing nearly a billion dollars in damages. And the saddest part about that is the groups that are hit hardest are those that are most vulnerable, such as the poor or the elderly. Also troubling
thing is that businesses in the US lose about $2 billion a year because of phishing, and usually specifically password phishing. And while it might be easy to think, well, this isn't my problem, I've never fallen to that Nigerian prince, the reality is when businesses are compromised because of phishing, they lose data, and often that data is your personal data. So why is phishing so successful in an ongoing problem? It's because it's hard to detect. So if you look here at this slide, we see two different URLs. One is for a bank website, and the other is for a phishing website. Take a sec and see if you can see the difference. If you can't, don't feel bad. The difference is only a single pixel large. And the reality is, even if you notice it this time, there's gonna be another time when you don't notice it. So phishing is something that really affects us all. My research takes two ways to stop password phishing in its tracks. The first is known as strong password protocols. Currently, when you go and sign into a website, you do so by taking your password, sending it to that website, and they check it against the password you used when you created your account. The problem is, if you're talking to a phisher, you've just given away your password. And so with strong password protocols that I've developed, we change this. So instead of giving away your password, instead you prove knowledge of it. And these are mathematical constructs known as zero knowledge proofs, so that the attacker doesn't even gain any information about your password. And even better, the protocols that I've developed then reveal to your browser that you were talking to the fisher and not a legitimate website, allowing you to block access to that website. Part two, safe password entry. When you enter a username and password, you do so on a website. Who controls that website? Well, the Fisher, and he's never going to use strong password protocols. So it's necessary that we remove password entry from the web page. Currently, I'm exploring moving it both to the browser or to the operating system itself. And as part of this, I build mockups and prototypes, and I test them and see how usable they are. And then most importantly, though, I bring people into our lab settings. I have them use these different prototypes. They have a chance to see how much they like them, whether they're annoying or helpful. And I also plan to conduct real-world attacks, phishing attacks against these people to see if what we're doing will really protect people. And the ultimate goal of all this research is that through strong password protocols and safe password entry, we can change the game. We can give you more safety while you're on the internet so that when you and your family are browsing, they can do so with confidence without having to worry that they're currently being phished. Thank you. When I was 21, I served a mission for the LDS Church. I attended BYU winter semester, left on my mission in May, and returned the following year around Thanksgiving. Could my father legally take a dependency exemption for me on his taxes for either of those calendar years that I was a missionary? Spoiler alert, no, he could not. But as long as the IRS doesn't hear this, I'll give you another spoiler. He did take it for both years. <laughs> My thesis question is threefold. First, what are the current practices of American parents today? Are they taking dependency exemptions for their missionary children? Second, what, if any, of the circumstances would allow them to do that? And third, if the circumstances don't allow that, but the current practices say many parents are doing it, what can be done to increase compliance with this tax law? So to determine the current practices, I did a research study, and I found that 91% of parents took the dependency exemption for their missionary children for at least one of the calendar years that those children were on missions. And 51% of those parents took it for every calendar year that their children were on missions. The circumstances for when parents can do that depends on various factors, but I found that there was one fact that was clear and true. All missionaries who serve the full length requested by the LDS Church will not qualify as dependents of their parents for tax purposes for at least one calendar year when they are missionaries. This means that at least 51% of the parents in my study broke the law, and one of these parents was my father. So my goal, now that my thesis is complete, is to educate anyone that will listen to me. This includes American parents of LDS missionaries, the LDS church, and even the IRS. This issue affects tens of thousands of American parents every year when they file their taxes. 
So what can be done? One, we can work with the IRS to carve out a clear exemption showing that these missionaries are dependents of their parents. And two, we can work with the LDS Church so that it can counsel American parents of current missionaries to know how to properly comply with this tax law. These are the two best options that I found. Thank you. know how alcohol would take over her life when she started drinking. She didn't know that she was changing the neurons in her brain. She drank at parties for years. After Amy got married and had kids, she knew she needed to change her lifestyle. She left the parties, but she couldn't leave the alcohol. Amy eventually found herself in a horrible situation, waking up with a hangover, unable to get her kids to school or to feed them, all because of her alcohol addiction. You heard many stories like Annie's, and you may even have close family and friends who suffer from alcohol addictions. In fact, over 17 million Americans suffer from alcohol use disorders. An addict will seek alcohol again and again, even after they know it's harmful. So what's going on in a person's brain that tells them alcohol is the solution to their problems when it's actually the cause? The answer lies in the neurons of the reward system. These brain cells regulate pleasure and reward. The main players are dopamine and GABA neurons. They begin in the midbrain, a region called the VTA, and they travel to the front of the brain, ending in the nucleus accumbens. When you get something awesome, like ace a test or eat a piece of chocolate, dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens. You feel great, and that makes you want to do that thing again. You can think of GABA as the brakes on dopamine. It's inhibitory, so make sure dopamine activity doesn't get too crazy. Drugs of abuse and alcohol hijack this system. It's like slamming on the dopamine gas pedal and knocking out the GABA brake. The car speeds out of control, but here's dopamine telling the brain, that was awesome, do it again. Over time, this system gets pretty messed up, and the gas pedal and the brake don't work properly for normal life. Alcoholics don't feel normal levels of pleasure. They think they have to drink in order to feel good. An addict will continue to seek alcohol even after it's harming other areas of their lives, just like in Anna's, Annie's story. My thesis focuses on GABA neurons and how alcohol changes their activity. I've, I look at inputs uh, to GABA neurons, and I found that certain proteins are shifting their function. During withdrawal from alcohol, GABA neurons become hyper-excitable, meaning they fire too much. And these proteins are delivering more excitation and less inhibition to these neurons. This may contribute to this drive state that says, I need alcohol, I have to have alcohol. If we can figure out what's going on up here in the brain, then we can develop better treatments and help real people who are suffering from alcohol addiction. Thank you. Imagine you finished graduate school, you're working as a postdoc for a professor in a lab, you're getting paid, you're happy. One day a professor comes to you and asks you to be on a payback, on a, excuse me, on a training grant. You think this sounds fine because this will pay for your salary so that your professor no longer has to pay for you. A few weeks later you're filling out some paperwork and you come across a payback agreement which requires you to agree that for every month up to a year that you're on the training grant, you have to agree to commit to staying in research or teaching for an additional year, uh, month. So if you're on the training grant for a year, then you have to agree that after the training grant's over, you'll spend another year in science doing research. Now, if you don't fulfill the requirement, then you have to pay back all the money that you received for that one year. So if you don't like this idea when you see it, you're in a difficult situation because you've already promised your professor that you would be on the training grant. News flash. Some professors are difficult to work with. <laughs> and he or she may not like it if you back out at the last minute. And that could prevent you from receiving the all-important letter of recommendation when you begin your next job search. 
what's inherently unfair about this uh, requirement is that the other 30 to 60,000 US postdocs in life science all receive roughly the same salary or stipend that are not subject to the requirement. This requirement is created by Congress and resides on United States law on the books. Congress created it to try to save money, but what it really does is create these really awkward, difficult situations between postdocs and their mentors. So if you're a postdoc and you're asked to be on a training grant, know that you're gonna have some obligations to fulfill. And if you're a professor, be responsible. Don't pressure your postdocs to be on training grants because it may be in your best interest, but not in theirs. Thank you. In my dating career, I was often asked, so, Bonnie, what do you study? Then came a moment of decision, do I tell the truth? On the occasions that I chose to tell the truth, what ensued was often quite awkward for me and very awkward for him. After all, talking about porn on a first date isn't the most comfortable thing to do. However, I've become more comfortable talking about my chosen field of study, and I hope that shows through this morning. I want to talk about two questions I've been looking at over the past year. The first question is, what does porn use look like among today's young adults? The second question is, how is this porn use influencing young adults' relationship? A question that's remained unanswered by scholars. So let's jump into the first question. What does porn use look like among today's young adults? In my international sample, which consisted of men and women ages 18 to 30, 85% reported ever viewing pornography. Now, an important distinction I found in my study is that just because 85% of young adults reported ever viewing pornography doesn't mean that 85% of, of young adults are or were porn addicts. After measuring for compulsive or addictive pornography use, I found that only 10% of young adults reported behaviors that could be recognized as addictive. So, bottom line, not all porn use is porn addiction and not all porn users are porn addicts. Let's jump to the second question. How is this porn use influencing young adults' relationships? The easiest answer is that it depends what kind of young adult you are. Now, we did find that porn use is associated with anxiety and discomfort in relationship formation, also maintenance, but we found that this anxiety was most present for two groups of people, men and religious people. For example, when compared to women, men were more likely to report that they had terminated a relationship because of pornography. Men were also less likely than women to have talked about porn in a relationship, and when they did talk about it, they experienced much more anxiety than women. Now, in terms of religiosity, we found that when compared to non-religious young adults, religious young adults were more likely to believe that their porn use made them damaged goods or somehow impaired their ability to be a good enough girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, or wife. So, what's the key takeaway for young adults in or hoping to be in relationships? As pornography use becomes more widespread and more common, young adults will need to talk about porn in their relationships because doing so in healthy ways will help reduce that anxiety and promote healthier relationships, especially for men and for religious people. Thank you. I want to start today talking about a 17-year-old boy named Josh. Josh was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when he was four years old. He had experienced some deficits in his social development. Now Josh also lived in a rural community, which made it difficult, if not impossible, for him to gain access to the services he needed in order to overcome some of those obstacles. His parents were desperate. They looked everywhere to find a social skills group for him to join. Eventually, they did find him one, although it happened to be quite a distance away from where they lived. They weighed the pros and cons, and eventually they enrolled Josh in that group. It is that social skills group that is located here at BYU, it's my thesis of which I'll be talking to you about today. Now Josh was one of 29 participants involved in our study over the last year. We used three different interventions to help individuals with autism, like Josh, improve in their social skills. The first intervention that we used was to teach the teens themselves. We taught them using the UCLA Peers model, 
which is a series of lessons geared towards teaching them social skills. Our second intervention involved us teaching the parents of these teens. We taught them using the same lessons that we had taught their children so that they would know how to help them in the home environment. Our third intervention involved us going into the community of these peers. And we taught the Disability Awareness Merit Badge. We also decided to teach peer inclusion strategies so that they would know how to invite individuals with disabilities into their activities. So what did we find? In the first intervention, we found overall success. All of the teens improved in their social skills. And we were really excited about that. In the second intervention, the parents were saying that their teens were improving by 17% in pro-social behavior and decreasing detrimental behavior by 4%, which was huge. And we were also really excited about these interventions. Although we noticed something interesting happened in the third intervention. Whereas Josh was a rock star in our peers group, we weren't seeing the same thing occur in the community. In fact, Josh was ignored. He was not given the opportunity to use the social skills that he had learned and that we knew he knew how to use. No one was talking to him, not his peers, not adults, no one. And we realized something. It is going to take more than one intervention in a community group to change the mindset. And that is our goal, to help individuals like Josh gain access to the necessary skills that they need, as well as the opportunity to use those skills. Thank you. In an effort to build company culture, foster a collaborative workspace, and attract millennials, many leading organizations are now intentionally bringing recreation into the workplace. And who wouldn't want to work for a company who provides access to rock climbing walls, yoga studios, and other opportunities to play at work? Now, recreation at work, originally coined industrial recreation, had humble beginnings in the 1800s, with perks as simple as a library for employees. Now, while that might not have you jumping out of your seat, there are much more exciting opportunities now to recreate at work, including swimming pools, nap pods, and massages at large companies like Google, and basketball courts and weight rooms at smaller local companies like Blender Bottle in Lehigh, Utah. Now, interestingly, Guadagnolo said that little data supports the value of employee recreation. And although this statement was made in 1978, there is still very little evidence that recreation at work provides any type of measurable benefits or return on investment for these companies. So why is it then that companies are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on employee perks with little or no evidence to back it up? This study sought to provide evidence by testing a model of recreation at work and examining the relationship between recreation at work and employee flourishing. The model has four sections. First is recreation at work activities. This is the basketball, the foosball, and the rock climbing. Second, it's important that employees perceive these activities as leisure. So we assess leisure as a state of mind by measuring perceptions of free choice, intrinsic motivation, and positive emotion during those activities. This then leads to feelings of being alive, fulfilled, or authentic and it's called personal expressiveness, which then leads to employee flourishing and includes engagement, resilience, and organizational commitment. We gathered data from 266 employees, and the results largely supported the model and were very exciting. First, perceiving recreation at work activities as leisure was crucial to achieving outcomes. Only when employees experienced leisure as a state of mind did we see three main outcomes. First was a direct increase in organizational commitment, sidestepping personal expressiveness. Second, as theorized, was a direct increase in personal expressiveness. And third, as theorized, when personal expressiveness increased, we also saw an increase in employee resilience at work. Now, although to date, there is little data concerning recreation at work, this study provides initial evidence to support this organizational practice and the role that it may play in more resilient, personally expressive, and committed employees. Thank you. Yeah. 
don't worry, this is not a presentation on the health benefits of drinking mouse milk. This is about mastitis. Mastitis is an infection of the mammary gland. It affects all mammals, including humans. In fact, about 30% of women will be affected by this disease. In the dairy industry, mastitis results in a multi-billion dollar economic loss each year. Most often, these infections are caused by bacteria found in the environment, like E. coli. And during the cow's life, there is a specific time in which they are the most susceptible to a severe infection. That is during the early stage of lactation. This increased susceptibility is due to a temporarily compromised immune system, and more specifically, in the way the immune response is regulated. So let's say you cut your arm and it gets infected. The immune response begins with the production of signaling molecules that stimulate the immune system and recruit immune cells to the side of the infection. Now once the bacteria have been cleared, a new set of signaling molecules appear to calm down the immune reaction to prevent damage to your healthy tissues. Now this same immune response occurs in the mammary gland. And during mid to late lactation, this system works perfectly. Infections are typically mild and the cow is able to clear the bacteria and continue producing milk. But during the early stage of lactation, when the cow's immune system is compromised, this doesn't happen. These infections are typically severe, 25% of which result in death. Now we know that over the course of lactation, there is a change in the production of these signaling molecules, but there's still a lot we don't understand. Now I grew up on a ranch, and I know firsthand how difficult cows are to work with, especially the ornery sick ones. So to study this disease, we use a mouse model. And although milking a mouse is challenging, they're much cheaper and easier to work with. And by infecting the mammary gland with E. coli, we're able to induce this mastitis infection and study the immune response. So when I first started this project, I could not believe that no one had tried to use a mouse model to study the most critical time in the cow's life. So that is what I have done. And by choosing early and late lactation time points in the mouse's lactation cycle, I have been able to replicate that severe infection and not only see a change in the production of these signaling molecules, but also a substantial increase in bacterial growth at early lactation compared to late lactation. So now that we know this new model works, we can begin to understand exactly how this impaired immune system is allowing these severe infections to occur. And we do this by experimentally blocking the signals or enhancing them and measuring the change in bacterial growth. And through this knowledge, we can hopefully increase the effectiveness of the immune response and make it better adapted at clearing bacteria from the mammary gland and reducing the severe symptoms of a mastitis infection. Thank you. Our country is crisscrossed by over two and a half million miles of oil and gas pipelines. Most of this network needs to be inspected every two weeks. Add to this millions of additional miles of canals, railways, power lines, and roads, and you have a pretty big job on your hands. The current method for inspecting most of this infrastructure is to fly along it in a manned airplane, look out the window, and try to spot any problems. This is expensive, inefficient, and in many cases, not terribly effective. UAVs, or unmanned aerial vehicles, are perfect for this type of work. They are inexpensive, easy to deploy, and have a limitless attention span. The focus of my research is giving these vehicles the intelligence they need to effectively monitor our world's vast collection of linear infrastructure. It begins with the UAV flying along the feature of interest in a standard flight path. HD video is collected and processed with real-time computer vision algorithms, looking for shifts in pipelines, downed power lines, or vehicle intrusions. When something is spotted, the UAV goes in for a closer look. A positive detection triggers sophisticated flight planning algorithms that plan the optimal inspection path needed for the UAV to collect high-resolution photographs of the area of interest and create a three-dimensional model at centimeter-level accuracy for later human review. Having completed its inspection, the UAV continues on its way, looking for the next anomaly. The end result is a series 
of highly accurate, geolocated, three-dimensional models of the areas of our infrastructure that need the most attention. This is timely, inexpensive, and highly actionable information. And just one more example of how UAVs are making our world a better place today. Thank you. Three billion people in the world still cook over an open fire. The smoke and the pollution from these fires causes over four million deaths every year. Different organizations have built and distributed improved cook stoves, which are capable of reducing the indoor air pollution by nearly 75%. But these improved cook stoves require the users to cook in completely different ways. And therefore, they quickly abandoned the new solution in favor of their traditional ways of cooking. My research is to discover how do we design improved cook stoves that are both socially and technically acceptable. To answer this question, we partnered with the small village of Locuto, located in Peru, where nearly everyone still cooks over two rows of bricks, as you can see in this picture. They like this way of cooking because they can cook with one, two, or three pots at a time, and they can burn nearly any type of fuel, including cardboard that they find in the streets. As we considered how to help these households, we knew that we shouldn't replace this way of cooking, but rather we needed to improve upon it. The result were these simple yet very practical pot skirts. These pot skirts function by capturing much of the heat that would normally escape into the surrounding air and forces it to come in close contact with the pot. These pot skirts improve the overall efficiency of the stove by 37% and decrease the total fuel required by 26%. We took 70 of these pot skirts back to Lakuta this past summer for testing and gave them to the families to use for two weeks. And then we interviewed them. The results were very positive. For instance, Maria, shown here, is one of the ladies we interviewed. And in her own words, this is what she said. These fire shields, as she called them, are like magic. The smoke is no longer in my face, and my food cooks much faster. Now, these pot skirts were very successful for Maria and other households in Lakuta but they would most certainly fail if used in other parts of the world. Why? Because of differences in lifestyle. Therefore, the greater value of my research is not just in the design of the specific pot skirt, but rather in developing the design process we followed in order to get to that solution. This design process is valuable because it can be applied to any region in the world, and it accounts for the unique challenges that cook stove designers face. For example, how does a design team test their assumptions when their target customer lives 10,000 miles away, doesn't have a cell phone, never goes on the internet, and it's really expensive to travel there? My hope is that my research will help remove many of the barriers that have prevented improved cook stoves from being user-friendly in the past, and ultimately help people, like my friend Maria here, start breathing a little bit easier. Thank you. As a paralegal, I saw how an attorney's careless emails shattered a custody case into a crisis. I also saw how another attorney smoothed divorce case fragments with skillful proposals. Because I'm a future attorney, I needed to know how new attorneys learn how to write. Because their writings impact our families, our friends, schools, businesses, and nations. How do law students develop writing expertise? Writing expertise means attorneys use subject mastery to write complex documents for diverse audiences. Expertise is experienced judgment. You can't buy this. You can't just learn it in the class. You have to try and fail and try again. Therefore, expertise is power. My thesis is the first to interview law students about how classroom writing prepared them to write during their first real-world workplaces, internships. Let me offer one key finding. Classroom mentorship enhances expertise, opening up opportunity. Students naturally divided themselves into two groups. The first eagerly sought out their TAs and professors for mentorship. And mentorship means students ask for frequent feedback and they graciously take painful advice, thus enhancing their writing skills. This attitude is surprising because law students are famous for brilliance, not necessarily humility. <laughs> By contrast, 
the second group of students not only struggled in the classroom, but they didn't seek out mentors. They isolated themselves. You know what happened? The mentored students got better internships, while the struggling students, they kind of got leftovers. Students were not mentored, surprisingly, during their internships because they were expected to be strong writers already. Thus, the classroom mentored students excelled and later landed jobs because they practiced and reinforced the same skills from class. The second group, however, was often frustrated again because they were asked to write new, alien documents. It's like they never really learned to play the piano and then they were expected to play the saxophone. This disconnect between classroom and workplace erodes student confidence. So the value my thesis adds is mentorship matters. This competition is over in 30 seconds. But for the rest of my life, I need to ask myself, because I'm a teacher and I'm a student, am I mentoring my students as best as I possibly can? Am I valuing the feedback of my mentors? After all, the best way to spell expertise is mentored experience. Thank you. And that was Jonathan Garcia, our final competitor today. Thank you so much to our competitors. If we can give them one last round of applause. And also, uh, if we could give a round of applause to our judges for all their work here. We'll, uh, as we crunch the, the final numbers, we'll have the announcement of our winners uh, in the next minute or so. We're going to ask our competitors if they wouldn't mind to come up here uh, as a group. Uh, we'll give them a, little, a chance to give a little bow, and then we're going to get a, a group photo of our competitors. Okay, we have our, our winners. Here we go. Uh, this was somewhat unexpected. I was afraid I was going to have a Steve Harvey moment and uh, announce the wrong winner or the wrong place, but uh, I'm not going to have that problem. Uh, we had a three-way tie for first place. So we have three first place winners. So. Uh, Instead of having you come up one at a time uh, and get a single photo, we will have you all three come up. We'll take a, a group photo of our, our first place winners. Um, and I will announce them in no particular order. Rachel Messick. <laughs> Ashley Nelson. And Bonnie Young Peterson.
Congratulations to our winners. If, if you want to come down here, we'll get you the paperwork. You can just walk down here. Yeah, we, we can have them even do it here, maybe. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for participating and watching and supporting the Three Minute Thesis. Uh, until next year, uh, we uh, hope to see you then. This will also be posted on our Facebook page and on our, uh, our website. So the, the full uh, presentations will be there. You'll be able to look at those again and watch them. So thank you and watch for the People's Choice winner.